Thank you. I had a small uh, audio-visual emergency this morning. So, good morning. I'm Eric. Uh, I'm from Vermont, and I'm making a map of Middle Earth, the setting for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So just to clear things up, I'm not talking about any films or role-playing games or upcoming television series. Within the context of this paper, I'm, uh, The Lord of the Rings is simply a novel written by J.R.R. Tolkien whom I'll refer to from here on out simply as Tolkien because I find J.R.R. hard to say. The book came out in three volumes in 1954 and 1955 because given Britain's post-war economy and paper shortage, the publisher wasn't able to justify committing the resources to such a chancy enterprise all at once. And it was a chancy enterprise. It's more than a thousand pages and it's a fantasy novel a genre that did exist in the 50s, but not so as anyone would notice. And it has footnotes and six appendices and poetry. So little hope did the publisher have that this novel would pay for itself, they offered Tolkien an agreement where he would receive no royalties until it had broken even. And this worked out really well for Tolkien, since to sweeten the deal, they also offered him 50% of any profit that it might make, and it has been moderately successful. <laughs> so they issued this not trilogy in three hardcover volumes. Paperbacks were almost unknown in Britain at the time. If it was worth using paper to print a book, then it was worth creating a book that would last. With these hardcovers, they were able to tip, fold out two color maps into the back of each volume, more colors would have been prohibitively expensive. These maps were drawn for publication by Tolkien's youngest son, Christopher, who was almost 30 at the time. And it's not bad, especially for an amateur who'd had almost no cartographic training at all. Christopher was not, of course, creating the maps out of his head with only the novel for reference. He was, in fact, meticulously copying his father's own working maps rendering them suitable for publication in two colors. Christopher was primarily copying from this, Tolkien's final map of Middle Earth. It was drawn in the late 40s, at about the same time that Tolkien finished writing the novel itself. You can see he was struggling with how best to show elevation, with contour lines, as in the south here, or with mountain symbols that are almost rudimentary hachures, as in the north central area. Now, all you proper cartographers here will no doubt have surmised that these maps are not projected, and the short answer is, yes, you're right. Sparing you all a Stephen Colbert-style deep dive into the cosmology of Middle Earth, let's just observe that within the story, what Tolkienists and other literary folk call the secondary world, where our own world is primary, Middle Earth is a continent, the planet is called Arda, Arda was created flat. Arda was reshaped as a globe by the Valar, gods or demigods, some 3,000 years before the events of the novels. Nevertheless, Tolkien ignored his own mythological reshaping of Middle Earth and mapped it as if it were flat anyway. In her Atlas of Middle Earth, Karen Wynne Fonstad, former director of cartographic services at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, advises that the only reasonable solution is to map his maps, treating his round world as if it were flat. Now, while we're on the topic of things I'd like to avoid taking any time on during the Q&A, Tolkien's geography. It's true that Middle Earth's mountain ranges are implausible. <laughs> Actual geologists have debated them and it seems that with some effort, one can come up with some scenarios that would explain most everything, even the mountain ranges. And we should remember that the theory of plate tectonics was developed 10 to 20 years after Tolkien had designed Middle Earth, and even then it was not immediately accepted. In a 1955 letter, just as the tectonic plate theory was getting figured out, Tolkien wrote, as for the shape of Arda, I'm afraid that was devised dramatically rather than geologically. I do sometimes wish that I had made some sort of agreement between the theories of the geologists and my map a little more possible. So with all of that behind us, let's quickly look at why there should be another map. Okay, 
I'm addressing a room full of map makers. There should always be another map, right? <laughs> but also, Tolkien wasn't satisfied. As he was working on one of his large-scale detail maps, he wrote, the map is hell. <laughs> I have not been as careful as I should in keeping track of distances. I think a large-scale map simply reveals all the chinks in the armor. And this was not an isolated outburst. But there are more reasons. For one, we now have the technology to do far better, to get closer to what, uh, what Tolkien actually wanted for far less cost. For example, as you can see here with his first map of Middle-earth, Tolkien originally saw his map as multicolored and multi-textured. It's hard to tell here since this map was battered by constant use and was constantly being updated too throughout the 1940s and early 50s, but he's used pencil, black ink, blue ink, blue chalk, and various colored pencils to make this map. That what we think of as his map is black and white with some red highlights on it was purely due to printing costs in 1950s England. And finally, we should just come right out and say it, Tolkien's maps are inaccurate. His son's maps are inaccurate. In some areas, locations are demonstrably, demonstrably 40 or 50 miles from where they're supposed to be. For context, the small-scale maps we've been looking at cover an area of about 2,000 miles on a side, so this is not wildly inaccurate. But that's a good two or three days journey on foot, and this scale of inaccuracy can be confusing or annoying if you're perusing the maps while reading the books. But that really brings us to the central question, doesn't it? What is reality in the context of a fantasy map anyway? What makes a fantasy map good? And is it really true, as Russ said at PCD yesterday, that the only rule with fantasy maps is that there are no rules? Though there's been much recent work on world building, sub-creation, and secondary worlds uh, that I could bear that I could refer to here, I think most fantasy readers would agree that though they can include more information, maps must not disagree with secondary world facts as presented in the book. Large and small scale maps should complement one another and never contradict one another. And though, I not, though not really a point of accuracy, I think most readers would urge that to the extent possible, maps should harmonize with the book's aesthetics. That is, a Google Maps or London Underground style map would usually be completely inappropriate. Now, if we're going to redraw maps because the existing maps are inaccurate, we need to ask why the originals are inaccurate in the first place, especially when they were drawn by the author. In a 1954 letter to Naomi Mitchison, Tolkien wrote, I wisely started with a map and made the story fit, generally with meticulous care for distances. The other way about lands one in confusions and impossibilities, and in any, in any case, it is weary work to compose a map from a story. Had he actually done this, there would be, of course, no problem. <laughs> However, it's clear from his notes and letters and from drafts and working maps themselves that he, in fact, went back and forth between the maps and the text writing and updating each in turn in a succession of layered waves. You can see this not only with erasures and with distinct writing implements and writing styles on this map. There are in fact places where Tolkien has applied as many as four or five new layers of paper over old to give himself a blank slate for redrawing. So it turns out that making an accurate fantasy map is really complicated. Who knew, right? Well, Tolkien knew. As he told Mitchison, it's weary work to compose a map from a story. That lined up before my, uh, my <laughs> problem this morning. But because we want to make a map that does not disagree with the textual sources, we must have a firm command of those sources. I'll spare you all an itemized list, but the relevant textual sources total pretty close to 10,000 pages of published material. Remember those multi-layered waves of drafts? He frequently changed his toponyms, changed the language of his toponyms, or changed his mind about the exact location of geological or political features. And sometimes he then recycled toponyms he'd previously discarded and used them somewhere else. In the history of Middle Earth, 
The history of Middle Earth traces all of this with writings from six decades, including additional poems, stories, drawings, etymological data, partial drafts, and revisions. But another difficulty is that Tolkien, quite properly, made different characters' observations more or less reliable. We might think that Sam, for example, salt of the earth as he was, was pretty good with distances. So if Tolkien writes that Sam tried to guess the distances and to decide what way they ought to take, it looks every step of 50 miles, we might take that distance as a fact. But then again, Tolkien as narrator says right in the book that maps conveyed nothing to Sam's mind and all distances in these strange lands seemed so vast that he was quite out of his reckoning. So we cannot just blithely state that a piece of information is accurate just because it is given within one of the novels. And that's doubly true of his drafts, of course. But the textual sources aren't all. Though Tolkien always denied any artistic abilities, he actually produced quite a lot of artwork. And much of it can be very useful in working out topography. More than 500 distinct Middle Earth related drawings, paintings, sketches, doodles, and site plans have been published over the years. This is becoming so difficult for me to track that I created the online Tolkien Art Index, which you can get to from the URL on most of these slides, and I have a handout here if anybody'd like it. And then in some ways, most important of all, there are Tolkien's own maps. Incredibly, there are about 70 of these if you include all the little sketch maps and plans and perspectives. And insofar as it's possible to read his writing, many of these provide huge amounts of information. So with all this squishy data, that is, is a given topographic fact from within one of the novels or from a draft? Was it written by Tolkien or perhaps by his son Christopher? Was it stated by the narrator or by a character and which character? With all of this data, I ended up creating a FileMaker Pro database, just like the National Geographic did, to help me track all of the relevant metadata for each toponym-related quotation and to rank information by how important and also how reliable it may be. It also lets me collect alternative toponyms for each location, whether they're simply names that Tolkien was tinkering with or endonyms or exonyms actually used by different peoples within the secondary world. Similarly, the database also lets me enter and organize the data that I can glean from Tolkien's Middle Earth related artwork and maps, including even working out for me the most efficient way to present a long list of coordinates. It also makes it possible to produce a comprehensive gazetteer concordance for each location on the map, probably in different versions depending on the level of complexity and thoroughness desired. And if this project also leads to an iPad app, the database would provide the pop-up text that readers would see when they tap and hold on a location. So to construct an accurate map with as many details as possible, we need to prioritize our sources, specifically, A, the text of the novels, keeping in mind the reliability of characters reporting, B, Tolkien's appendices, introduction, and other apparatus of the novels, and see the maps as published within the novels. Then, Tolkien's own writings and artwork from after 1955 and Christopher Tolkien's revised map of 1980. And finally, draft maps, draft text, and artwork from before 1954. But interestingly, this order of priority is not the order in which the work must be accomplished. In terms of constructing a new map, it turns out that Tolkien's idea of starting with the map actually holds. If I were to start with the text, I would need to invent quite a lot myself, which I want to avoid doing at all costs. For example, the sea is mentioned a bit in The Lord of the Rings, but not more than an inlet or two is described of the three or 4,000 mile coastline. If we consider the existing maps as canon insofar as they don't disagree with the text, it's best to start with the existing published maps and adjust them to make them agree even more with the text than they do. Tolkien constructed several of his maps with a hand-drawn grid, which more or less matched from map to map. I found it useful to proceed square by square through these maps de-skew each square 
and drop the result into a layer of a reference document in Ortelius on my map. The next step, then, is to create normalized reference maps out of Tolkien's inconsistent map work, having analyzed its artistic contour lines, toponyms, and geographical features. That's supposed to be fading into that. There we go. By normalize here, I mean essentially to show in a consistent manner. For example, I consistently show elevation with layered contour lines accentuated by shadows and highlights for an extra sense of uppy downiness, to quote John Nelson. These maps are, of course, not the aesthetic I think appropriate for a Middle Earth map. But each will then serve as a guide in its own transparency layer when it comes time to draw the final map in a style much closer to Tolkien's. And here is, well, not the end result. In fact, it's part of a very early proof of concept, which I sent to Christopher Tolkien along with sample gazetteer entries when I conceived of this project a few years ago. Young Mr. Tolkien is now in his early 90s, and he's generally not engaged in correspondence with his father's fans. And so I was surprised and elated when I did, in fact, receive a response. It's a lovely letter. And I was gratified that he wished me the best for the project's continuation and completion. But I wanted to point out his description of his own goals and implicit hopes for my project. I am no cartographer myself, he said, unless one means simply that I have drawn a lot of maps of a most unusual kind. My object has always been no more than to discern, interpret, and present on paper, largely following his own style, and as accurately as I could, my father's intentions, notably of the endless movement of his conceptions that often make his own maps extremely difficult to interpret. This too is my goal. It's still a ways off yet, but I thank you for letting me share with you some of the steps that I'm taking to reach it. Okay, the, the question is, I guess, if I can encapsulate that, uh, is there overlap between the Silmarillion maps and the Lord of the Ring maps? There is a very little bit of overlap, yes. Uh, the, the mountains in the extreme left, uh, uh, the stre extreme west, um, uh, shown, does that bring it up? Yes. Mountains in the extreme west there do overlap with mountains uh, in the extreme east of the Silmarillion maps, but not Gondolin. Okay. Thank you all for Thank coming you. to Extreme Cartography. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>